Today on Investigate TV Plus. Get up, up. A father's fight to protect student athletes from the same tragic fate as his son. You know, life changed for us at that moment. And then what we realized, kids kept dying. See his efforts to raise awareness about a deadly condition some experts say is preventable. I'm confident that Jordan's always smiling down on us. Plus, more and more guns are being stolen, and it's not from homes. Your car is not a holster, meaning it's not a safe place to store your gun. We have an in-depth look at the dangerous trend, what experts say you can do to protect your family and help keep weapons off the streets. We're going to start in two minutes, so let's, get, let's come on in. And children finding their rhythm in a challenging world. A dance instructor helps students through unique classes. It doesn't matter what your limitation is. We're all going to move, we're all going to dance, we're all going to have a good time. In-depth stories that inform and inspire. You're watching Investigate TV Plus. In communities across the U.S., fall means football season. I'm Lee Zurich. And I'm Tisha Powell. Long before game days, there's typically summer training when extreme heat and sports can make for a dangerous, even deadly combination. Our coverage begins at Mid-American Nazarene University in Kansas. That's where family members say 19-year-old Mizell Law struggled during a practice in late July 2023 and died from heat-related injuries. He was such a special person. He really was. School officials told us they have not been officially informed of a cause of death, but Law's parents say his body temperature reached 108 degrees and the teen spent days fighting for his life in the hospital until his organs failed. We were told people don't last 24, 48 hours. He gave us a week. Their heartache still fresh when we spoke to them in August of 2023. And for another family in Maryland, it hits close to home. Reporter Heather Graff takes an in-depth look at the push to protect student athletes through life-saving lessons and potential legislation at the federal level. He was 6'2", wore size 15 shoe when he was like maybe seventh, eighth grade. Jordan McNair was a big kid with big dreams. As a family, we always thought Jordan would play on Sundays. And in May of 2018, he was well on his way, playing for the University of Maryland's football team when he collapsed during an off-season workout. Literally, we got a call. I got a call from a uh, University of Maryland campus police officer. He said, hey, there's been an incident on the field. Jordan's parents, Marty and Tanya, learned he'd suffered heat stroke at practice, and they rushed to the hospital. Son, if you can hear me, squeeze my fingers. Son, if you can hear me, blink your eyes. I had no idea what a heat stroke was. I had no idea that, you know, it could, it could lead to us having a conversation three days later, less than 72 hours with a, uh, a organ uh, transplant doctor, because 85% of his liver is in necrosis. But within two weeks, Jordan was gone. It was just, you know, life changed for us at that moment. And then what we realized, kids kept dying. The National Center for Catastrophic Sport Injury Research actually tracks those fatalities and has found it happens most often in football. In fact, the center says 157 football players have died from exertional heat stroke since 1960, stretching across all levels of play, from youth programs to professional. And more recently, between 2018 and 2022, the sport saw an average of two heat stroke deaths per year. It was like, how do we turn this pain into some type of purpose? And so began the Jordan McNair Foundation and this family's mission to save lives by raising awareness about the dangers of heat related illness in student athletes. If I could do it all over again, I would have told him to listen to his body. First of all, when his body told him to stop, stop. Bottom line. When we sat down with Marty McNair, he was visiting the Hamilton Youth Football Club outside Baltimore. Bittersweet because this is the same organization where Jordan first fell in love with the sport. Yeah, this is where it all started at. And as the kids practice. You know, I always get emotional during draft day. Marty holds a meeting with their parents. It can happen just like that. Sharing Jordan's journey, as he's done countless times over the last five years, with families, coaches, and players all over the country. 
The main thing is this, family. Plant these seeds of self-advocacy in your student athletes now. Marty also talks about signs and symptoms of heat stroke. Anybody know what a heat, heat stroke is? Show of hands, anybody? And for more insight on that. Every second counts. We spoke to the president of the National Athletic Trainers Association. It starts with something as simple as the athlete might get a little dizzy, confused. Um, they may become nauseous. What makes it so dangerous? Well, it's basically the body's inability to cool itself anymore. And if the core temperature becomes too high, it becomes life-threatening for that athlete. Yet she says heat stroke deaths are preventable with early recognition and proper treatment. Which is a cold immersion tub that has to be cool enough so that that athlete is placed in that tub immediately before they're put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital. It's why the McNairs have now donated about 400 cold water immersion tubs to sports teams nationwide. 400 literally from Alaska to Florida. Plus, Marty says they're advocating for legislative changes, including a bill recently introduced in Congress that's called the Jordan McNair Student Athlete Heat Fatality Prevention Act. If approved, it would require college athletic programs to develop and implement a venue-specific heat illness emergency action plan that includes cold water immersion equipment. What does it mean to you to have legislation introduced in Congress named after your son? I just thought that was the right thing to do to honor Jordan's legacy. And for this still grieving father. I think that a well-practiced emergency action plan would have saved Jordan's life. That's the only playbook that matters. Do you have an emergency action plan? Do you have athletic trainers? Is anybody CPR certified? Do you have safety equipment? Do you have a cold water tub? Do you have an AD machine? Do you have a first aid kit? These are all things that you should be asking any organization prior to signing your child up to play with them. Perhaps the most high-profile heat-related death in football is that of NFL player Corey Stringer, who died in 2001 after he collapsed during training camp with the Minnesota Vikings. The Corey Stringer Institute is now dedicated to heat stroke prevention and says there's been a 100% survival rate when the athlete is cooled immediately through cold water immersion. The Corey Stringer Institute has outlined the best practices for preventing catastrophic injuries in student athletes. The Institute has also scored states by their use of comparable policies. Florida, New Jersey, and Georgia are the top three states with sports safety policies, according to the Institute's evaluation. Minnesota, California, and Maine scored the lowest. Potholes plague roads across the country. We have an in-depth look at how old tires could pave the way for a smoother ride. But first, an effort to curb the number of stolen firearms circulating in the U.S. They're not stealing guns to go hunting. They're stealing guns to commit crimes. Where police say thieves search for unsecured weapons and what you can do to stem the tide of illegal guns. You can watch Investigate TV Plus anytime online. Just subscribe to our YouTube channel at Investigate TV. You can catch stories and full episodes. Thousands of guns are stolen every year, and the ATF stresses the number of stolen firearms circulating in the U.S. is likely higher because many gun thefts go unreported. We uncover what's become the biggest source of stolen guns and what you can do to prevent theft. People with masks and gloves captured on video breaking into cars in Tennessee. They're not stealing guns to go hunting. They're stealing guns to commit crimes. The mayor of Memphis calls attention to a growing trend, guns stolen from cars. If there weren't guns in these cars, they wouldn't be breaking in nearly as much. In Amarillo, Texas, police have seen similar heists unfold. Cars are, are wonderful, but they're our biggest source of problems. We have a great number of guns stolen from cars, both locked and unlocked. And the problem is not limited to Tennessee and Texas. According to Every Town for Gun Safety, a nonprofit that advocates against gun violence and for gun control, an average of at least one gun is taken from a car every 15 minutes. 
Their analysis of FBI data found in 2020, an estimated 40,000 guns were taken from cars across 271 cities. A stark increase from a decade ago, when that same data showed fewer than 4,000 guns were taken from cars. Every town ranks cities with the highest rates of gun thefts from cars. Memphis and Chattanooga, Tennessee topped the list, while Columbia and North Charleston, South Carolina were among the top five. The nonprofit's analysis finds in 2020 the most common source of stolen guns, cars parked at home. If you leave your gun in your car, it's likely that sooner or later it's going to get stolen and then it goes into the hands of criminals. And when thieves go looking, it's not always random. Police in Arkansas say they tend to target pickup trucks. Guys may be looking for a specific car to target or a kind of vehicle to target. There may be vehicles that tend to have guns in them more often than others. There's a saying in the community that your car is not a holster, meaning it's not a safe place to store your gun. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, firearm instructors stress locking your car door should never be considered secure gun storage, and that includes a locked glove compartment or center console. So this is um, what a lot of people use for their cars. For those leaving their weapon in the car, experts showed us lock boxes made specifically for vehicle storage. It's a small safe that can fit under, under a seat in the back. And the cool thing about this is that you can actually bolt this down mm. to your vehicle. Some lawmakers are taking steps to hold gun owners accountable should their firearm be stolen from a car. We need to have a conversation. We need to promote policies that promote responsible gun ownership. During Louisiana's 2023 regular session, State Senator Gary Carter introduced a bill that allows a gun owner to be penalized if their firearm is stolen from an unlocked car, then later used in a felony. I think everyone agrees that we have too much gun violence. So what do we do to make sure that, hey, if you're a responsible gun ownership, don't leave your gun in an unlocked car. While the measure did not make it out of committee, he believes secure storage can help curtail a supply of firearms. Many of the guns that are being used in these felonies are being obtained from stolen cars. So we need to have a conversation. We need to promote policies that promote responsible gun ownership. Whether you leave it outside or take it in your home, officials and police say locking weapons is the key to slowing down this dangerous trend. The harder we make it for stuff to get stolen, especially firearms, the safer our community is going to be. As of September 2023, only 15 states require gun owners to report lost and stolen guns. Every town for gun safety says states should pass laws that require guns to be securely stored and not visible when left unattended in cars. Only California, Connecticut, and Oregon have done so. Still to come, students of all abilities inspire to shine. And give yourself lots of love. Meet the instructor who's helped dancers find their own beat. But first, roads peppered with pothole problems. Researchers explain how tires can be the solution. Our in-depth coverage continues. You can get connected to Investigate TV Plus on all social media platforms. Crumbling cracked roads are a familiar sight across the country. According to a AAA survey, in 2022, nearly two in 10 drivers had to get their vehicle fixed after hitting a pothole. And the average cost to repair the damage was more than $400. Scientists in Michigan believe the best solution to patching the pavement might have been right under us the whole time. Reporter Meg McLeod has an in-depth look at how scrap tires could fill the gaps. Pothole, plagued, pavement. Many Michigan roads have long been a pain. But now, what we use to drive on them could become part of them. The major part of the work we're doing is trying to recycle scrap tires. Jianping Yu of Michigan Technological University is the lead researcher for several road projects across the state. Do you have uh, other rulers or only this one? Yes, we only have one. He and his PhD students are moving forward. This crack is basically usually due to the low temperature. 
on studying rubberized asphalt One station, second okay. station. for two busy roads in mid-Michigan. While the idea has been around for about 20 years, rubberized asphalt is still an evolving technology, and you and his team are taking it to new heights. What starts as a scrap tire gets separated into rubber chunks and ground into a powder that's then combined with stones and asphalt. Not only is it touted as longer lasting, quieter, and more resistant to the climate, it also gives scrap tires another life. Discarded tires are notoriously difficult to recycle and notoriously beneficial for mosquito breeding grounds, and they are plentiful. Michigan, we generate one tire a year per resident of the state. So you start looking at that, that's almost 10 million tires in a year. That's why Kirsten Clemens says the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy is focused on finding new uses for old tires, from construction to cushioning stalls for cows and horses. We can get right down to rubber dust. I mean, it's it's like powdered sugar and, you know, you can do things with that. And the team from Michigan Tech is confident this soon to be rubberized road will last at least five to 10 years longer than traditional asphalt. I think 20 years is a very reasonable or even conservative estimate. The hope is that projects like these will dig up new interest in this evolving technology. It plants the seed for those future projects to say that, hey, this stuff really does work. Making where the rubber is in the road a benefit for drivers across the state. AAA outlines a couple of ways to save your car and wallet from pothole damage. The first is check your tires, which includes tread depth and tire pressure, as well as suspension and alignment. AAA also advises drivers to keep your eyes on the road and be cautious of standing water as it could disguise a pothole. Next on Investigate TV Plus. I was actually training to be a professional ballerina. An injury derailed her dreams, but she didn't let it stop her from dancing. So I decided to just turn it into something positive. See how she's inspired confidence in kids of all abilities. You can watch Investigate TV Plus anytime streaming online. Get the app for Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. They're free to download. Signing kids up for dance classes can have a massive impact on their lives. And the YMCA says it can improve their mental and physical health as well as their social skills. Reporter Lauren Korn introduces us to the instructor in South Carolina who's inspired students to dance to their own beat. We're going to start in two minutes, so let's, let's come on in. It's a wonderful program. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get in our circle. A program that allows children to dance to their own beat. Up! In my class, you're going to see a variety of children. You may see your typical child. You may see a child that is having a hard time getting on task, or maybe they look a little different. And that's exactly who Jennifer Roselli wants in Together We Dance. And give yourself lots of love. A class that focuses on confidence, grab your beach ball, and creative movement. I was actually training to be a professional ballerina, but I got injured, so I decided to just turn it into something positive. I'd always loved working with a special needs population and had a passion for dance, so I thought, let's put the two together. Jennifer wasted no time teaming up with Palmetto Dance Stars to help kickstart the program and Stand provide the dancing up. space. Very good. The children ages 4 through 12 Very learn good. all styles of dancing. Very good. Including ballet. Five, six, seven, eight. And tap. One, two, step. We love tap. Oh, they really enjoy our little Here's tap routine. Away we go. But they really get excited over the freeze dance. Great moves, Hannah. Good job, everybody bopping to their favorite song underneath the colored spotlights. But when the music freezes, I typically say, okay, you know, get in an arabesque or show me a big pose or a soft pose or a silly pose. Whatever it is we're working on that week, because every week I have like a different goal that we're working on. She and her hand-selected group of volunteers who work with the tiny dancers one-on-one. -on -one. Beautiful! And popcorn! Popcorn! Brenda Purvis volunteers as Jennifer's assistant. This is a great opportunity for kids that are disabled and who are not. It gives them a chance to be inc included in it. It's 
a gift for them to um, do something that, they'll, that they want to learn. Can you say hi? Hi. Say, I'm Hannah. I'm Hannah. I'm Leskowitz. Hannah Leskowitz and her sister Caitlin recently joined together We Dance, <laughs> both sharing a passion for music and dancing. You ready? They have really creative routines and the music matches every move. Do you like dancing? <laughs> I love to dance in the air. Hannah also loves dancing at the studio. It's a welcoming environment and a perfect fit for Hannah, according to their mother, Leslie. There is some limited like, communication issues, and so sometimes if she's not paying attention to the whole dance class, you're not really sure how much she's getting out of it, but then we see it at home. Like She is picking up on the dance moves and she is learning. A feeling that Jennifer wants everyone to experience. Everybody can relate to dance. Everybody can relate to movement. And that's, so, that's what's so magical and wonderful when we come in this space. It doesn't matter what your limitation is. We're all going to move. We're all going to dance. We're all going to have a good time. Great job! Parents of special needs children, they're always looking for something that works for their child, and it looks like this studio is working for a lot of children. It's definitely working, and she had the best line, you know, everyone can relate to movement, everyone can relate to dance, it's just a great experience for everyone there. I they know. have a good thing going. They do. And that's it for us on Investigate TV Plus. I'm Tisha Powell. And I'm Lee Zurich. Thanks for watching. Next time on Investigate TV Plus, a mysterious diagnosis kills hundreds of babies in the U.S. every year. When you lose a child, you are thrown into a very deep depression. Like It's hard to pull yourself out of that. How this mother is making sure other parents don't endure the same pain.